I have a question this morning I want to start out today's message with, and, and this is the question. What makes a pastor a pastor? Have you ever thought about that? Is it, uh, is it someone who can preach? Well, that guy can preach, so he's, he's a pastor. That, that gal can preach. Or is it, is it someone who's been to Bible college and has a Bible college degree? Does that make them a pastor? Um, what about, what about if, if the church voted on someone to be their pastor? Does that make a person a pastor? Or is it a, is it a career choice? Do, do people just decide, you know what? I think I want to be a pastor. That sounds like a good career. I'm going to be a pastor. What makes a pastor? Well, there, there's really one answer, and it's this. A pastor is a pastor because Jesus personally called them to be a pastor, right? Now, once Jesus calls them, should they go to Bible college if they haven't already? Yes, that would be great. It's not a prerequisite to be a pastor, but it would, it would be good. Um, it would be helpful if they could actually communicate. That would be good if they could preach. It would be good, you know, if, if the church affirmed them as pastor in some way, that would be great. But, that, but those things alone don't make them a pastor. It's the calling of Jesus that makes a person a pastor, right? We're gonna talk about callings and, and some other things today. Actually, everyone, everyone in the world has a calling from God. And, and there are some very general callings and there are some more specific callings. Ephesians 4, we're going to be looking at several verses in Ephesians 4 today, but Ephesians 4, 1, Paul kind of starts out with this idea of calling, that people have callings on their life. Ephesians 4, 1 says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You all have received a calling. Every person has received a calling from God to move from darkness to light. Right? Every person has been called. Now, not everyone answers that call, but everyone's been called. Right? Um, once, once you do answer the call to move from darkness to light, from being lost to being saved, then we're called to, to be discipled and make disciples. Right? Jesus said, go make disciples. So you are called, if you're a believer, to make disciples. So there, there are many different callings. You probably have several callings from God on your life. Some are pretty uh, general. Some get fairly specific. Um, there are some really specific callings from God that the Bible talks about here in Ephesians 4.11. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. We talked about this last week. I hope last week was really, I think, a, a really important uh, foundational message of where we're going today and next week and, and on into 2023 um, of how, how Jesus set up his church. And it says that he gave uh, gifts to the church, and gifts are are actually people that have been called to a specific type of ministry, very specific. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it talks about the different callings in Ephesians 4. So he's talking about these callings and these gifts. I remember, I clear as a bell, when Jesus called me to be a pastor. It was the Wednesday before Super Bowl in the year 2000. So we made it through Y2K, didn't have any meltdowns, and like, hey, we're gonna survive as civilization. Remember Y2K, those of you old enough? I never thought I'd say that. Are you old enough to remember Y2K? <laughs> like, people who were 22 or younger don't remember that, right? Um, but it was the Wednesday before Super Bowl. We were living here in Fairfield. We, we owned a business on Main Street, and I was, uh, I was walking to... Uh, to work, kind of cutting through the alley. I remember I was going right behind the grocery store, came right around by the dumpster. I remember exactly right where I was. There's a little chunk of two by four laying on the ground. I mean, I could just see it like it was like yesterday or maybe even today. And right as I came around the corner, I, I did, it was not an audible voice, but it, it felt like it. It, it. it was a voice inside my head so strong that I knew it wasn't mine and, and different than how I think. And it, it, and he said, I want you to be a pastor. 
And the reason he said it with that inflection, and I knew, I, right away, I knew it was Jesus, the voice of God. I knew that. Um, and the reason he kind of had that inflection is because I had known for really actually most of my life subconsciously that God had a call on my life into ministry. I, from a very young age, I felt like so inadequate. And I guess we all are. I mean, God qualifies us, right? But I, I felt so like, no, I, there's no way I can do that. And so I, I squashed it down all my life. <laughs> like when little kids, when they don't want to hear something like, na 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 Like, that's kind of like I was whenever this idea of b- being called a ministry. So it, uh, it almost became, like I said, subconscious, not conscious. But that day in January of the year 2000, it became very conscious. And, and I knew it was a yes or no question. First thing I said was, I can't preach like Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe Pearson was my pastor at New Song Church in Shoto. That's where we were attending that, at that time. And he, I, I just loved the way he preached. I loved his messages. I said, I can't preach like Pastor Joe. And just right then he said, I'm not asking you to preach like Pastor Joe. But if you'll listen to me and be humble and obedient, your sermons will be powerful. Like, uh, I know who you are, and I know what you're asking, but I'm gonna need some confirmation. No disrespect, sir. <laughs> and, and so for the next three days, I just kind of wrestled with it myself. Like, I know, I know that was him. I know what he's asking, but me? I mean, there's a hundred people in the church I go to that know more about the Bible than me. Like, why? I mean, shouldn't he call somebody who knows more stuff? (laughs) And I finally went to my pastor and I said, you better sit down. Uh, This is weird. God called me to be a pastor. And he goes, yeah, I know. Like, what? Why didn't you tell me? And he said, well, you need to hear it from God which I'm so glad he did that because if he'd have told me I was supposed to be a pastor, like, yeah, right. And you're supposed to be an NFL football, play, NFL football player, whatever. When God tells you something, like, you know it, and it's either yes or no. Uh, I, I told my wife, <laughs> and she said, oh, I always knew you'd be a, a, called a pastor. You'll make an awesome pastor. I'm so happy for us. Oh, wait, that was a dream I had. Because <laughs> what she said was, you? <laughs> and I don't blame her, you know, because it's like two things. Her dad was a pastor way back in the day, and the church just, a couple of churches he was in just ate him up and spit him out. And so two things she never wanted to be was a, a, a farmer's wife or a pastor's wife, and I helped her accomplish both of those. <laughs> <laughs> in one lifetime. But God gave her some dreams and vision a couple of weeks down the road that really affirmed that call. And, and he began to just confirm and affirm. And it, it almost got laughable. So, okay, we're doing this. And uh, my understanding of pastor at that time was basically, it was very basic. And kind of what I had seen growing up was basically the pastor's the preacher and he's the spiritual ambulance. Now that's not necessarily biblical, but that's kind of common. That's mostly what we see. Like he preaches on Sunday and he visits people in the hospital other days or counsels, you know, bad marriages or, you know, whatever. That's what pastors do. And, and they do do that. And I did do that. <laughs> but in addition, it's like I had these sort of other burdens and passions to, to see the kingdom expand and and um, so I did preach and I did visit people in the hospital, but uh, I think about 2003, we planted a church um, in Shoto. I mean, in, I was in Shoto, in Shelby. We were New Song Church. We called this church New Life because we thought that really was a good name. <laughs> and I still think it's a good name. And so we started that in 2003. That church is going strong today. In 2006, on Easter Sunday evening, we planted a church uh, first service in Conrad, and that church is thriving. Uh, I just heard a report from Conrad. There's 150 kids in high school in Conrad. 50 of them go to the youth group at New Life Church in Conrad. That's a third of the high school going to the youth group at New Life Church, spirit-filled 
powerful church. It's like, that's an amazing testimony. And then they have lots of people coming on Sundays. So it, it just, it's just really heartwarming to see those works that we started years ago uh, flourishing. Uh, it was 2014, November 23rd, we started having services here in Fairfield. And what grew out of this is what has grown out of that. And we, we had services in the prison. Um, I would actually preach live via video into the prison every Sunday morning. And then I would go up there during the week and visit them and counsel them. Um, we started doing Freedom Weekend. There's lots of other things other than just preaching and doing hospital visits, right? And so, um, but something kind of weird happened. April 16th of 2012. Again, I remember that day extremely clearly. I remember the date, I remember the time. I was in our family room in our basement, we were living in Shoto, and um, just happy with how things were going on. Life was generally good. And uh, I had been watching TV and I shut it off. It was just kind of dark in the room. I was just sitting there by myself on the couch. And I just, I knew I was in the presence of God, not like, not like some, oh God, I'm coming into your presence speak to me. It wasn't like that. I'm just kind of hanging out. I just kind of, I do that with God. I just like, I kind of know he's there. And, um, and I was just sitting there and all of a sudden I felt this weight come on my shoulders, but a, a good weight, not a bad weight. It felt like somebody had rolled up like a quilt and it was warm and heavy like quilts are and, and placed it on my shoulders and I could feel it, I could physically feel it. it again, it, I knew it was a good thing, and it just came on me, and I was like, whoa, God, what is that? And he said, it's a mantle of transition. And I know what mantles are, they're in the Bible, right? They're like a calling from God, they're a commission. <clears throat> and it's like, well, I've been called to be a pastor, what's this mantle of transition? I knew God was doing it, I know he was, calling me, and, and, but I didn't really get clarity on what this transition was. It's like, so then I start thinking of things like in the flesh. Well, what, what could that be? I'm kind of like Abraham and Sarah, like, well, we're supposed to have this baby. We better, we better do it and it's not happening with you. Let's do it this way. So I think I probably had a few Ishmaels in those years where I was trying to make something happen in my mind that was part of this mantle of transition that God had given me. And... Um, it's like, am I supposed to help churches transition? Because we had just transitioned in 2010 in church from a, a good church to where the Holy Spirit re began to really unleash his power and really touch people. And we saw healing starting in 2010, just like, like every week, literally. I'm not, I'm, ask people that were there. It was every week. Some of you were here that were healed during those times. And... Um, and just a mighty move of, of the Spirit. <laughs> Interestingly, in those next few months after that, we lost about 20% of our congregation. They're like, this is weird, we're out of here. They were longtime church people before they even came to our church. But within a year, we were 30% more in attendance than we were before they left. Which means after they left, we grew half again. And you know what's interesting? Those 30% more people were almost all unchurched, unsaved people. What does that tell you? It tells me that the religious people were weirded out about what the Holy Spirit was doing, but the people who didn't know better, like, well, isn't this what Christianity is supposed to be? Isn't there supposed to be power? Isn't there, isn't there some supernatural component here? Like, yeah, this is finally what we're looking for. And, and so anyway, I'm kind of getting off a little bit. Um, so, so I thought, okay, are, am, I supposed to, am I supposed to help churches kind of go through what we just went through, moving from like nice church, sing some songs, preach a nice sermon, uh, don't challenge people too much and make them mad, and go home and eat roast beef. Ch transition from that to like, yeah, preach a good sermon, but let's, let's talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about what God wants us to do on this earth in his name and through his power. Not that I had all the answers, but I'd seen just this amazing transformation in our church. Like, am I supposed to help other churches do that? Maybe, and I kind of thought that was it. 
But I didn't see really a door for that. It's like, maybe that transition, like maybe I'm supposed to be a pastor somewhere else. Like, God, are you calling me to go somewhere else? And so I kind of investigated that a little bit. Am I supposed to be, uh, at one point I thought, I thought I was maybe supposed to be a pastor in Helena. There was a friend that uh, was stepping down from his church and he's like, can you, like, you should come be pastor at our church. Like, well, maybe this is what God wants. But it, it wasn't. <laughs> So for about a year and a half, it was like, I don't know what this is. But in that year and a half, I began to really study, think about it, and not just me, but in our leadership of our church, um, Ephesians 4.11, that talks about what we call the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher. Because it's clearly there in the Bible. And as we'll see in a minute, it's clearly still for today. That didn't end with the first apostles, which were capital A. Like there still are, there's still supposed to be apostles today and prophets and evangelists, as well as pastors and teachers, right? I begin to understand that biblically. A few years before that, if you'd have said, um, you know, the apostles are for today, I'd be like, heretic, no, they're not. <laughs> Although that was very unbiblical, it's just because, well, if it was for today, wouldn't we see it in our church? Like, wouldn't we have them? (laughs) What I didn't realize is that churches in the last 20 or 30 years have been waking up to this truth in Ephesians 4. And um, so I begin to like, this is biblical. And there's a reason it's here. I don't know, like, how does that look in our church? And we begin to kind of talk about it a little bit. And then, and then one day, I don't remember the exact day, but in just time hanging out with God, he says, you know that mantle of transition? I'm like, yeah. He goes, it's the mantle of apostleship. I'm like, whoa, that's weird. Me? You're calling me to apostleship? Okay. Because I, I, I knew it was biblical, but, like, but it, was, it was weird. Right? I mean, is that okay just to say it was kind of, hmm, I know that's biblical. I don't know what to do with that. And so at our next elder meeting, at that time, I think we had five or six elders, and uh, Jeremy remembers this time. I, uh, I went to the elder meeting and I said, hey, I know this is kind of weird. I don't mean to weird you out, but God has called me to be an apostle. And I was expecting them to go, what? (laughs) Like, apostle? I was expecting that. And basically the response was, well, duh, Mike, of course. Like they saw that calling on my life before I realized I had it. And we talked last week about what apostles do. We'll talk more about it today. How do they, what does that look like in the church? But but I just wanna, I just wanna say this. I began to really understand that if the pastoral calling in Ephesians 4, remember he, he gave, Christ gave these gifts to the church, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher. Pastor is only mentioned, just actually at the word pastor is only mentioned one time in the Bible, it's in Ephesians 4.11. The word shepherd, which interchangeable for pastor, is used a couple of other times, all right? Apostles used a ton, and prophet and evangelist. Pastors actually used the least, but it's what we see the most, so it's like, if all those five are in a, right here in the Bible together, and if pastor is a valid thing, which it is, then doesn't that make the other four valid? Four. <laughs> and I, it's like, yeah, right? I mean, am I right? I think I am. If, if, it's, if pastor is a valid calling, out of Ephesians 4, then aren't the, other val- aren't the others valid? Because there's no place that says, okay, uh, apostles pass away, prophets pass away, but pastors, they'll stay. And, and, and I talked about this last week, I'm not gonna revisit it, but you should go watch the video if you haven't seen it, how after the first 300 years of the church, let me back up, first 300 and some years of the church after Jesus resurrected and, and went to heaven, operated 
very biblically. They operated with a five-fold ministry. They operated that way. They operated with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They operated with salvation by faith. But when man injected, began to inject himself into the church, um, starting in the mid-300s and later 300s, and it became more of a man-made church, and they started putting things in, we started, the first thing we lost was apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers, replaced by a form of an Old Testament priest. So that's the first thing that was lost was a five-fold ministry. The next thing that was um, lost was the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then water baptism for believers. They, they baptized babies, which is, is not biblical, but they, they, baptized, but they lost baptism of the believer. And then the last thing they lost was salvation by faith. It became salvation by works. And that was that way from the late 300s, roughly 400 AD, to the, what started, what started kind of re-instituting these things back into the church, the Protestant Reformation I talked about last week in 1517. Martin Luther, he, he got the church back. The first thing that got reinstituted in the church was salvation by faith and not by works. So the last thing that disappeared from the church was the first thing to be reinstated. The first thing that was lost is the last thing being reinstated, which is a five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets. Gifts of the Spirit came back in late 1800s, early 1900s. So those things that were lost from 400 AD to 1500 are being restored. It's taking some time, but we're getting there. And like I mentioned last week, the last 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, this, there's been a, a, an, a, a reawakening of Ephesians 4.11, like, that's biblical. But we've not, been, we've not been doing it for so long, it's like, it's weird. It's like, no, we have pastors. And, that's, and, and they, they, do all, they do the work of the ministry. Except that's not biblical. <laughs> People are supposed to do the work in the ministry. Pastors are supposed to help equip them, as well as apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers. So again, I guess what I'm saying is like, this is a valid thing, and it's for today. Now let me re- reread uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. We, haven't, we read that last week, and I want to just kind of uh, review a couple important points from last week, then we'll, we'll move on. Ephesians 4, 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Remember, he's building the church, it's his church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Verse 12, their responsibility is to do all the work of the ministry. Well, people sit by and watch and smile and clap for their awesome pastor. No. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do the work to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Like, so many people think, well, the pastor does all, he does the ministry, and, and we, like, give him thumbs up. Like, no. My job is not to do all the work of the ministry, although I need to minister to people. My job is to equip you to minister along with me to one another. This idea of clergy and laity and this big separation, this big gulf, is not biblical. That is unbiblical. Now, there is a, call, a specific calling in the fivefold, but that doesn't make them more important. It doesn't make, it, we're all important. We all do the work of the ministry. People who are called to the fivefold ministry, their main calling is to equip people to do the work of the ministry. Are you with me? Because that's big. All right. Verse 13. This is also really important. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, listen to this, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand unless you're really proud, how many of you are at the full and complete measure of Christ? Like you're 100% Christ-like. Just nobody. Well, I didn't tell you, I told you not to raise your hand because I didn't want to embarrass you. 
but nobody, nobody's gonna raise their hand, right? It's like, well, I think I'm doing pretty good, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not Christ-like. Now, there will be a day, the Bible says, there will be a day when you will be perfected, the Bible says, it means complete. There'll be a day where you will be complete. And there will be a day when you are perfected, that's the day you see Jesus face to face. That's either when you pass from this earth and go to heaven, or when he comes back, whatever happens first. When you see Jesus face to face, the Bible says, Ephesians 13, you, you're complete, right? So until that happens, we're supposed to be having apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, equipping God's people to build up the church, to make it more mature, to minister one to another, so that we look more like Christ, more and more like him, until the point that he comes back. So when people say apostles aren't for today, it's like, God bless you, but how can you possibly say that? Because here it is right here. There is nowhere in the Bible, nowhere where it says apostles were for this time when Jesus was on the earth and now they're no more. That is not in the Bible, nowhere. It's like, well, then why don't we have apostles? Because the, the church, I would call it the man church, um, got rid of that, replaced him with Old Testament priests. We, we, we've got to live as a New Testament church. We don't want to do man church, we want to do like Jesus church. All in favor say aye. Okay, vote carries. That's the only time we're going to vote in this church. We're voting to follow Jesus. No. So here's some, here's some uh, important review points from last week. I'm just going to go over these very quickly because this is from last week. Number one, certain people are specifically called by Jesus to equip all believers to do the work of ministry. Right? We just talked about that. Certain people, apostles, prophets, evangelist, pastor, teacher. We all do the work of the ministry, but certain people are to equip others. All right, number two, the fivefold ministry was instituted by Jesus when he was on the earth and is to continue until his return. All right, we just talked about that. I mentioned this last week. In the Bible, there are, I think, about 20... 25 named apostles in the Bible. You think, no, there was 12 apostles. Well, 13 if you count Judas, and then he was replaced. Well, then there was Paul, okay, so that would be like, okay, that would be like 14. Well, then there was Barnabas, and then there was Apollos, and then, there, you know, go, actually, and I mentioned this last week, there was a female apostle, Junia. She's in Romans, check it out. Anyway, uh, that, that blows a lot of people's minds, like, oh, Female, no, that couldn't be. Got to be a wrong uh, translation of the Bible. No, there was. Anyway, um, because apostles were instituted by Jesus to be in operation until he comes back to do what he said here in Ephesians 4.11. Number three, fivefold ministers are to impart the grace that has been given them to equip God's people. All right, there's two important words there. Impart and grace. I'm going to talk about those because those are going to, as we end our service today, these two words are going to be very, very important, very biblical, very life-changing to you. The word grace, a lot of people would say it means God's unmerited favor. That's a little bit right, but very incomplete. It's God's unmerited favor. In other words, if God gives you grace, you don't earn it. He just gives it to you. But it's a supernatural empowerment to do what he's asked you to do. So God gives you things that you did not earn that empower you supernaturally to do what he's asked you to do. That's what grace is. All right, so that's what grace is. Impart means to give or bestow. Uh, it means to give a share of. That's the dictionary meaning. So like... Um, if I have something and I give part of that to you, I would be imparting that to you. Now, that kind of presses the, the spiritual imp implication too far. I mean, you might be asking, I'll explain that in a minute. You might be asking, um, like, is that, even, is that even biblical? Impartation? Like somebody could, somebody could impart a grace to someone else, a grace that they have, they can impart that to somebody else? Is that biblical? The answer is yes. 
Paul said, told Timothy, I long to come see you. I want to come see you because I want to lay hands on you and impart to you some spiritual gift. He didn't say just some spiritual gift. I want to come see you so I can lay hands. I'll write letters to you, but I want to come see you. I want to put my hands on you and I want to impart a gift to you. That's biblical. So in this context of Ephesians 4, and remember, when you're looking at Bible passages, you have to look at it in context. If you start cherry picking verses, you can make the Bible say whatever you want to say, and many have. It's how some really goofy denominations or even non-Christian religions have started. You, gotta, you can't just like cherry pick verses, you've got to look at it in context. In the context of Ephesians 4, Paul's talking about calling, and he's talking about grace, that you, you have this grace that God has given you. But then he says this, and this is, I, this, this is a new understanding to me in the last few months. Ephesians 4, 7. So understand the context we're talking in. But to each one of us, grace, all right, that supernatural empowerment, right, to do what he's called you to do, was given to you according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, our mind wants to go, well, what's Christ's gift? Well, that grace. No. In the context we're talking about, what, what are Christ's, what's Christ's gift? Shout it out. Nobody's going to shout out. They're like, it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher. Isn't that what, remember Ephesians 4.11? And Christ gave these gifts to the church. Is that, it says that there, right? Christ gave these gifts to the church and he names this, these, what we call the fivefold ministry. Okay? Is that in the Bible? Yes, because we've got to connect the dots here. This is, this is huge understanding here. Okay, Christ's gifts are these people, but you receive grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna say something, but let me preface it by this. God can give you grace sovereignly on his own without any other person being involved. He does that. He'll, he will do that for you, he'll continue to do that. However, there are times when God works through people as a conduit, as a pipeline for his power and his grace to flow through a person into someone else. That's what I believe Ephesians 4, 7 is talking about. Like he's talking about equipping, like you need these five ministers to equip you to do what I've asked you to do. And the grace I've given you is according to the measure of my gift, the fivefold ministry. I think that's a really good interpretation of this. I think it's biblical. It makes sense in all the context of everything else. Again, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you need someone to lay hands on you to, to have grace in your life. But what I also am saying is that there are times when that can, be, that can become very powerful. I've, <laughs> as I look back now, I, I've, I've purposed to get in front of somebody that has a grace that I want. Like a, like a well, we, we, don't, we call them all pastors, but they're not all pastors. I realize, I realize now one, one guy, um, was, was, he's totally an apostle. He just doesn't, he doesn't wear that label, right? He doesn't have to be called apostle. People who have to be called something probably aren't something. <laughs> and, and I've just shared with you that God's called me to be apostle and I don't, I'm not trying to like, um, I don't want to minimize that calling at all, but please don't call me Apostle Mike. <laughs> you don't even have to call me Pastor Mike. If you want to, you can. It's, it's okay. I get that. It's a societal thing. Actually, you can just call me Mike. Right? You can just call Paul, Paul. You can just call Peter, Peter. You can call Jesus, Jesus. Right? You get the point? I'm not saying... I'm not saying you can't use those terms, but if, if somebody insists that you use those terms, probably a red flag going on there. 
Okay, now I gotta come back to remember, remember where I was. Um, God uses certain people to impart a grace that they have. Now, if I, I have an apostolic grace on my life, I didn't ask for it, God gave it to me. I started operating in that before I even knew really what an apostle was or what an apostle did. I was operating that way because that's how he's given me that grace to do that. I, I, back in the day, I was called to be a pastor when I was 40, so before that, I had no interest in any of that. Like, yeah, I go to church, yeah, I wanna see people saved, yeah, I, I give money, and yay, yay, we're good, check that off. Like, I wasn't like, oh man, I gotta get into the church and just make a difference. Like, I, that was so not me. Like, let me just like, play in the worship team, play bass, go home, watch football, just like, don't ask too much of me, right? <laughs> God had to give that to me. And I didn't ask for it, but he did. And then he, and he had to, over the time, over years, say, here's how I've equipped you. Here's the grace I've given you. Now walk in it. Now let's do this thing. And so, according to Ephesians 4, 7, I can lay hands on someone, which doesn't make them an apostle, but I can... I can impart through the, it's not me, it's Jesus doing it, but I can be a conduit for imparting the grace, uh, an apostolic grace. I'll explain in a minute what that is, all right? It doesn't make you an apostle, but it gives you some of the same passion and vision that I have, that God gave me. Um, so here's number four, point number four. God's grace for certain areas flows to us through the grace given to Christ's gifts to the church, which are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's what Ephesians 4, 7 says. Again, that's not the only way you can get that grace, but it is a way, and it's an important way. And we're waking up to this. But I, re I was going, <laughs> the guy that I got in front of that was apostle, like he, he laid hands on me, prayed for me. There was an impartation I realized, now that I looked through the lens of history, looking back in the rearview mirror, like that was a real pivotal time for me. It wasn't like I turned around and walked back down the aisle. It was at a big conference, and uh, this guy's a well-known guy. And um, like, <laughs> when I'm standing right in front of him and he's you know, laying hands on me and praying, I mean, that was significant, because like, wow, this is a real famous guy. He's all, like a real hero of, my, of the faith for me. I've learned so much from him through his books and all this stuff. And then, but turning and walking away, it's not, I can't tell you that I felt real different. It's like, that was cool. It was more like, wow, that was cool. Wait till I tell people back home, that was, that was cool. But now that I look back, it's like, it was just a real pivotal time for me. That impartation made a difference. Um, I got an impartation from a guy named Randy Clark. Some of you heard of him. This is another guy. Pretty famous guy. Um, he he he's kind of noted for when he prays for people, they get healed. Like a, like most people, not all people do, but most people that he prays for get get healed. He's started a thing now where he's he's collecting medical proof of healings, like before and after X-rays and CAT scans, just to sh prove to the world that this is a thing. Actually, he came to Bozeman, Montana, of all places, and I went there. And he gave an impartation to me. And I'm telling you, not everybody I pray for gets healed, but a lot do. And I believe that uh, some of that is due to that impartation. Maybe not all of it, but at least some of it. It's powerful. Impartation is powerful. And I think as a church, we just, we're missing a lot of that. Because it's, it's weird, right? It's not like what we've been doing for the last 1,500 years. But it's totally what the church did for the first 300 that's why, they, that's why they metaphorically exploded all over the face of the earth. And when man got involved, it just put a real damper on it. All right, so what do, what do apostles do? So if, what is the grace that God has given me as an apostle? Here it is, number five. 
Apostles are visionary leaders with a passion to build the kingdom of God and are to equip God's people to have vision and passion to expand in the kingdom of God here on earth. I, I told you, I didn't start out with this passion. Maybe I've been a visionary. My wife would call it a dreamer. <laughs> I, think, I think I see dreamer as a good thing. <laughs> Some people will see dreamer as not a good thing. But, but God gives dreams to people. I don't, I'm not talking about like night dreams, although that, that can happen, but I mean like vision. That would be a better word, like vision of the big picture. Like we can get so focused on the little petty things of church that when we get just focused on that, what we call minutia, right, the little things that really don't make that big a difference, we can get petty and judgmental and self-righteous and I see that so much in church, but I see where there's really an apostolic grace flowing in a church. Those churches are less petty. They're less judgmental. They're less self-righteous. I'm not saying they're perfect because there's people there and we're all imperfect. But I'm saying vision and passion for the kingdom is important. It's like this big picture. Do you get the big picture? Why are we here? Why are we doing what, are we do- what we're doing? Why are you even sitting here this morning? If you don't know that, we're in trouble. I mean, not not like we're going to hell, but we're just not doing, we're we're not being as effective as we could be. All right? There are churches that are seeing people saved and, you know, and they're discipling who don't have a big picture view and they don't understand the kingdom. So they can, you know, you can do okay. But I'm just like, how much are we missing when we don't really embrace what Jesus instituted. He clearly instituted the fivefold ministry. If we're not embracing that, all five, instead of just one, how much are we missing? The answer is probably don't know until we like tap into that. Like it's pretty good now. Just think what it can be as we like embrace this. As we have different, and here's the plan for the, actually next week, Saturday night, Sunday night, same service, uh, and then, on, and then in, in different services in, in, after, in the next year, 2023, is to have five-fold ministers come in and lay hands on you and impart to you the grace that they carry. So next Saturday night, Sunday, my friend Norm Christofferson, who's a pastor, who's called to be a pastor, and is really a pastor, which means care. We'll talk more about that next week. Pastors are shepherds. They care for people. Actually, I can make a good case that the last person of the fivefold ministry to teach and preach would be a pastor. I can make a pretty good case for that. Like you, I'm not saying they couldn't preach or shouldn't preach. I'm just saying their main job is not only to care for people, but to equip the body to care for each other. Get that? So, so Pastor Norm will be here next Saturday night, Sunday. I'll be here too. And he's going to lay hands on whoever and impart this passion to care. Because I don't know about you, I don't have that passion in and of my own. I need a God-given grace. I mean, I care, but do I really care enough to like actually do something? You understand what I'm saying? So I'm gonna be first in line for Pastor Norm next week, all right? Just telling you. I'm here Saturday night, I'm getting it. Um, so let's get back to apostles. I, I do care for people and I need to care for people. I'm pastoring this church. I can pastor this church with an apostolic calling, all right? That's okay. I'm not like, I can't be here anymore, I'm not a pastor. Again, I can make a better case for the apostles, but anyway, I already said that. Um, My calling is to see the big picture and help you to see that, help you to know why you're here. What are we doing? I shared this last week, and it's so important. Jesus didn't invent apostles. Apostles were a thing not, not in, the, in the church sense, not in the religious sense, but in the governmental sense. Rome had apostles, all right? 
um, in their government. And here's what apostle literally means, sent one, right? The sent one. That's what apostles do. Um, Rome was a world power. They conquered lots of nations. When When their military conquered a nation, the next people they would send in were the apostles, and the job of the, of the apostles, the sent ones, was to establish the kingdom of Rome in the conquered country, make the conquered country look more like Rome. Apostles in the church that Jesus put together is, are called to make our place on earth look more like heaven. We're to bring the culture of heaven to earth. We're not, we're not in heaven. We'll be in a perfect place someday. However, we're called to make our place look more like heaven. That's the Lord's prayer, by the way. Basically what that's saying. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? So it's biblical. That takes kind of a big picture person and it has to be somebody of passion to see the kingdom built, to see the kingdom advance. And you have to have that passion. It's not enough for me to have it. You need to have it. Now, you don't, you, you're not an apostle. You don't need to equip others, but, but you need to be able to see the big picture and have that passion. Because Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The powers of man tried to conquer it. The powers of man back in 400 AD tried to think, well, we have a better idea for church. Let's do it this way. That way we can look awesome. And, and, the, and the peasants can follow us and we'll really be somebody. I'm not saying everybody had that attitude, but it was a prevailing attitude. Just look at, just look at history. It'll bear that out. That is not the church of Jesus. Church of Jesus says, hey, I've given some people who are no more important than anybody else some callings to help equip them to be my hands and feet on this earth. Jesus is all of these things. Jesus is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. He's all of those because he's Jesus. But he knew that in our imperfect state, even though we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we, not one person can be all of those. That's why we're called a body. Some are hands, some are feet, some do this, some do that. But we're building his church. You can, you can go to church or you can be the church. I'm glad you're going to church. I'm glad you're here. And Jesus is glad you're here. And you should keep going to church. But there's much more. It's called being the church. Being the people that God has called out. That's exactly what church means, ecclesia, the called out ones, the assembly of the called out ones. We need to be the church because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is not physically here. He's spiritually here. He's in us. He's here, but he's not physically here. But you are. And because you are and because we're the church, then In a way, Jesus is physically here through you. You're not Jesus, but you're his hands and his feet. For us to be his hands and his feet, for us to be the representation of Jesus on this earth, we need to have vision for his kingdom. We need to have passion for that. We have to see the big picture. We have to have passion to advance his kingdom not just to go to church. God gave me that, he gave me that passion and that vision and he wants me to impart that to you. And it's not like I'm giving you part of what I have and now I have less. That's not how that works. I'm just a conduit. I'm just a pipeline for God's power working in me and through me imparting that grace to you. And so we, we're gonna, that's how we're gonna close our time today And next week with Pastor Norm is what we're going to do. In fact, uh, uh, why don't you stand as we close this morning. And our prayer time people are going to come up. We're going to have prayer time people here on either side, kind of off to the side. And they're here to pray as we close in worship for any need that you have, whatever that need may be, relationally, health need, financial need, 
Uh, maybe you don't know what the need is. They just need somebody to pray with you. They're here for that. I'm gonna ask everybody else, if you, if you want an impartation of apostolic grace, um, I'm gonna ask you just as we, as we start worship, I'll, I'll tell you when to come, not now, but just come and stand up here in the middle along the front and I'm just gonna work through. I'm gonna lay my hands on you and I'm gonna impart, I believe biblically speaking, impart an apostolic grace into your life which will give you vision and passion for the big picture, all right? Because you're gonna need that for all the other things we're asked to do, okay? So you, you got what we're doing and it, you feel un, don't feel obligated to, that you have to come forward. But if you really want this and you need it, <laughs> You, everyone needs it, but if you're, if you're willing to come forward, uh, I want to lay hands on you and impart that to you as we continue on in worship. So um, go ahead and come on up now, or if you want to go to their prayer time, people, and we're going to continue in worship. Let me just pray real quick. Lord, thank you. Jesus, thank you for your gifts to the church that equip the church, your people, to look more like you so that your church looks more like you to the world who desperately needs you. Lord, though, the local church is the hope of the world because you're the hope of the world and we're your hands and feet. And that's a responsibility, Lord, we don't want to take lightly. And so with all seriousness, Lord, we ask you now as people come forward that as I lay my hands on them, Jesus, that you would just give them a, that grace, that apostolic grace to have vision and passion for your kingdom, to see your kingdom be built on this earth, to see the culture of heaven come to their spot on earth. We pray that now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come on forward for prayer and impartation.